Okay. Well, thank you for having me come and speak. Um, so I am the director of the MS Center at Georgetown. I'm also chair of neurology at Georgetown and neurologist in chief of the MedStar system. It's uh, one of the ninth largest hospital chains in the country. Um, the, our MS Center, we have about 3,000 MS patients. We've been part of the pivotal trials for all of the MS uh, uh, disease modifying therapies over the past 35 years. Uh, we're actively doing research in areas of remyelination as well as uh, involved in about 25 clinical studies for MS at this point. Um, so my goal today really was just to talk to you about the background uh, about MS um, and just to give you a flavor of what, what this disease state is. So that's me. That's my, my mom wrote that for me. It was wonderful, except she wanted to add at the bottom, he never calls me, and so there it is. <laughs> um, so before we talk about the disease-modifying therapies, I think it's important, just a little background about uh, multiple sclerosis, just so everybody's on the same page. So um, this is an autoimmune inflammatory demyelinating disease of the brain. Forty years ago, George Ebers did a study. This is before we had medications for MS. And what he found was that if you had MS for 20 years, there was a 90% chance you would be in a wheelchair, period. So this is a disease which does not forgive. It is progressive. It, pro it is progressively inflammatory of the brain and the spine. It leads to loss of function of the legs, the bladder, the bowel, sensation, tremor, vision, all of these things. And so it progresses. But where we are now with our disease-modifying therapies, we do not have that statistic. Uh, we do not have 90% of our patients who are in wheelchairs after 20 years. In fact, it's probably the inverse. We are probably at about 10% are in wheelchairs after 20 years because the disease-modifying drugs have really changed tremendously our ability to treat MS, which for all intents and purposes is a rheumatologic disorder. This is, if we can start to modify the immune system, we can start to change the natural history of the disease, and we have. Um, we haven't found a cure yet because we don't know what causes MS yet, but we know how to treat the underlying inflammation. So currently we have 15 medications uh, for MS that are FDA approved, uh, and they basically fall into three categories. They're either oral, injectable, or infused medication. Um, do they work? Yes, to some degree. There's three uh, big um, endpoints for our clinical trials that we look for. Number one, does it decrease the number of attacks? And all of them do that. That's the primary endpoint for just about all of the studies. Number two, can we pre prevent progression of the neurologic disability? So there are patients who will see us. A year later, they will come back, and now their walking is impaired. That's, they have disability progression. And so that is our number one thing that we want to prevent, is having somebody accumulate disability progression. Number three is can we see the changes on the MRI either diminish, stop, or possibly reverse. And the MRI is, a, is basically our biomarker uh, and shows us the inflammation. So really our big three are relapses, progression, and MRI findings. Um, once somebody's diagnosed with MS, we absolutely want to treat them as early as possible. And this is no different than rheumatoid arthritis. The earlier you treat the sooner you will prevent injury to the brain, just like in rheumatoid arthritis, the sooner you treat, the more you will prevent the um, damage to the joint, which is irreversible. And the brain, to some degree, the injury is irreversible, but not completely. We do know that there is the ability of the brain to heal itself and to remyelinate itself. It's not very good, but there are, um, I was just at a meeting, which is absolutely fascinating. So it turns out that there are stem cells in the brain. I was very interested to see that you have a stem cell company. But there are stem cells in the brain, but they're stuck. And they cannot go to the next step and differentiate. Um, and now the idea of how do we turn them on so they differentiate is really fascinating. So these are our drugs that are helping us at least diminish the inflammation. Again, the injectables, there are seven. Orals, there are three. And infusable, there's actually a fourth one, ocrelizumab which is not on here. I'm going to go through them individually. So um, I'll start with the injectables, which were the first generation of drugs. They came out in the early to mid-90s. 
Um, glutirimer at the top, copaxone or glutopa. Uh, this is a random hexamer of amino acids. Essentially, it's myelin basic protein. People say, you know, patients say, so what, what is this going to do for me? Well, it's like allergy shots. And you give it below the skin and you desensitize the person. And so their immune system quiets down almost in a natural way. It's really a fascinating way. And patients understand that concept. Oh, allergy shots. If I have peanut allergies, if I get a shot, then I won't be allergic to it. That's right. And why am I allergic to this? Well, your immune system is attacking your brain. If we can desensitize it to myelin, then it will stop that process. Very easy to understand. Um, and because of that, because it's a random hexamer, um, it's extraordinarily safe, with the exception of injection reactions, because this is a subcutaneous injection. Initially, when it came out, it was a daily injection, and there's a formulation which is now three times a week, um, still subcutaneous, and you can still get injection site reactions, um, and then some other, occasionally people will get shortness of breath and chest pain, very unusual. You know, we don't quite understand why that is. We think that patients are injecting when they inject subcutaneously, they actually some of that is getting into their bloodstream, so they're getting a big bolus and they're getting this chest pain. Um, the, but no liver issues, uh, no liver enzyme issues, no hepatic issues, no uh, uh, hematologic issues, no opportunistic infection issues. Um, the remaining, Avonex, beta seron Rebif, Plegrity, Extavia, all of these are interferons. Um, they too are disease modifying but different. They essentially downregulate uh, lymphocytes. Um, they don't suppress the immune system, so you don't get opportunistic infections. Um, however, they modulate it enough that patients, because they are exposed to an interferon, uh, will get very significant muscle aches, fevers, myalgias, uh, joint pain, um, and they will get it almost with every shot. After a period of time, it may diminish. Um, and these are given, as you can see, either every other day with beta seron, three times a week with Rebif, once a week with Avonex, once every two weeks with Plegrity, and Extavia is a generic, which again is done every other day. And at the beginning, when we had no other drugs and patients were told, well, you have MS, this is how we want to treat you, they say, well, tell me about it, well, all we have are injectables. Patients did it because we had no choice. They did it but begrudgingly, and there was a lot of noncompliance, because as you can imagine, doing a shot, particularly Avonex, which is intramuscular, which you had to self-administer, all of these are self-administered, it's a disaster. Um, and in our clinical trials, patients do really well because there is structured adherence that patients have to do it as part of the trial. Once you're in phase four and post-marketing, we really don't know what the heck happens. And our, we strongly believe that a lot of patients are maybe doing this half of the time when it comes to injectables. And so a very important point that as we talk about something where you have a structured compliance where someone will come and potentially give you a shot once a month, the compliance and the efficacy is gonna go through the roof just based on that. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, Zinbrita is an interesting monoclonal antibody which is also subcutaneous. Unfortunately, um, it is associated with um, potentially uh, fatal autoimmune hepatitis. And so patients, there's a REMS program for Zimbrita. Very hard for us to um, um, uh, prescribe this to patients because they have to get their blood drawn every single month and they have to have their blood drawn before they can actually get the next injection. Very difficult. Um, and so this one, it's a terrific drug, but really has not taken off because of the um, technical issues. The oral agents seemed like they were going to be terrific. Well, we we're going to get past all of the injections. This was our next iteration of medications. And so um, Gelenia came out, followed by Tecfidera and Abagio. And um, these are either once a day or twice a day medications. The efficacy for them is terrific. But then again, we ran into side effects um, with all three of them. As you can see with Abagio, this is category X in pregnancy, so it is a teratogen, and it causes hair loss. So 75% of patients with MS are women, and they're young women. We diagnose them in their 20s and 30s. So when you say to them, oh, there's a drug that you may, uh, may be teratogenic, you're going to really have to be on long-acting long reversible contraceptive, either an IUD um, or Implanon, they're going to say, well, I I'm not sure I want to do that. And in addition, it can cause liver issues and it can cause hair loss. So this is not very attractive to a young woman. Uh, Gelenia, 
Um, again, it is a terrific, the, the endpoints are terrific, easy, once a day. But here we're running into issues with opportunistic infections. So in the label now, there have been cases of, car of um, uh, fungal meningitis, cryptococcal meningitis. We have cases of progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, which is a fatal viral disease of the nervous system. And so we've now, and then Tecfidera, same thing. We now have cases of progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. What is, that, what is the significance of that? Well, we've pushed the immune system too hard. Our injectable medications, they were good at keeping the immune system quiet, but we didn't push it down so hard that we saw opportunistic infection. That's not the case with these three medications where you can push the immune system down too hard, and now you're not able to fight off the opportunistic infections. And progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, that I actually studied this virus. I grew this virus when I was a postdoctoral fellow at the NIH. I'm very familiar with it. I've taken care of probably 300 patients with this disorder. Um, this is an ugly disease. And when you try to explain to a patient with MS, oh, you're duly diagnosed with MS, and these are the drugs, but you may actually develop an opportunistic infection, that's extraordinarily difficult. And this is a patient who's already scared, who's already read that this is a disease that might cripple me, and now you're telling me that I may go on a drug that may injure me even more, or I may get a fatal infection, or my liver may become a problem, or in the case of Tecfidera, I may have gastrointestinal symptoms that I'm going to have on a daily basis. And so, and trust me, I use all of these medications. I use every single one of them. Um, and it's a conversation that we have to have with patients. The um, intravenous uh, therapies, which are really the new kids on the block, although some are a little older. Um, our first one was Novantrone. This is um, uh, in the same family as um, uh, adriamycin. Uh, terrific drug, was very useful for patients with very aggressive MS and secondary progressive MS. However, it's cardiotoxic, and there's a lifetime limit on it, and it can cause acute myelogenous leukemia. And so this we, had, we used because we really had no choices back in the early 90s, but really we don't use it at all now because the risk is just too high. AML uh, with Novantron is one in 100 patients potentially, so that's, that's too high. Um, Tysabri came out in uh, the early uh, to late 90s. Terrific medication, once a month infusion, blocks the ability of white blood cells to get into the nervous system. However, there have now been almost 700 cases of, of progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy with this drug. And that is extraordinary. We've never had that many cases with any drug. There's something peculiar about Tysabri. And again, this is a drug that is um, we can do some testing to see if people are, um, don't carry the virus or harbor the virus, but again, very difficult. Um, Lemtrada is, um, again, a very interesting medication. Five infusions the first year, three the following year. Um, and then you may not need anything after that, although that's not clear. Um, but the thing is, 30% of patients will develop thyroid disease. 2% will develop idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpur, ITP. And then one in 300 will develop good pastures and will require dialysis. Um, and I had a case of, of a patient that developed uh, ITP on Lemtrada, and it was ugly. This patient showed up in my office and she said, you know, I've been bruising for the past two days. She had a bruise around her eye, and I thought, I think you have ITP. And she had only had only eight months out from her Lemtrada. She came into the hospital, her platelet count, which normally is 400, was zero. And then she was in and out of the hospital for probably about three months as we treated her to try to get the ITP under control. Um, and then Ocrevus, uh, again, once every six month infusion, terrific on the efficacy standpoint. Um, however, there is a malignancy signal with Ocrevus that the FDA has recognized. And, and in particular, we have a breast cancer issue with this, um, that the FDA has said, you know, in primary progressive MS, it didn't work in women, and all you're doing is getting the risk of breast cancer with this. Why are we, why is this even approved for women with, with prog primary progressive MS? And if you look at the FDA's um, um, discussions on that, it was pretty clear that it almost didn't make it there. And I'm, I know I'm preaching to the choir, you probably know more about this than I do. Um, <laughs> But that malignancy signal, again, when we have young women and we tell them, this is a terrific medication, but you're going to have to be infused every six months, 
but we have this risk, um, that's tough. And there's also the risk of infusion reactions, and we just don't know what it means to completely, to B cell deplete somebody f uh, continuously for an extended period of time. So, so that's kind of where we are with our landscape. It is a difficult discussion sitting in the clinic talking to, to patients. And I'm an academician, and we spend a lot of time talking to patients. Um, and I've kind of gone through the first top of the slide, you know, where the landscape is and the kind of discussions we have to have with patients. But they're not, they're not insignificant. And patients are becoming very safety conscious and very risk adverse particularly in the MS space, because they have seen all these cases of PML, they have friends that may have had a bad outcome. And so they'll come to me and they'll say, well, tell me what's new. And then I'll say, well, this is what's new. And they'll say, well, tell me about the side effects. And they'll say, number one, is there any PML? So our patients know about PML. And then I'll say, yes or no. As soon as I say yes, they're like, I don't want to do that. And I will move on. Um, and then they are extremely, do I, is it part of a REMS program? They will say, use the word REMS, or some type of surveillance program. Yes, it is. I don't want to be part of that because if they're surveying me, there must be something that potentially could happen to me. Which brings us to uh, Copaxone and glutamic acetate. So we have been using Copaxone for about 25 years. Um, and again, this, the, and there are two things um, that we're going to talk about. One is, what is the value to the patient? And number two, what is the value to the practicing clinician? And I think this is an extraordinarily important point that gets missed, but what are the dynamics of the, the prescriber and that patient-physician interaction? So every four weeks, GA, depot. What is the conversation I have with the patient? Very straightforward. Um, are there side effects? Pretty much no. Your only, are there PML? No. Is there cryptococcal meningitis? No. Is there autoimmune disease? No. Is, are there going to even be skin reactions? Probably not, although there might be because this is a deeper injection. How often is it? Once a month. And then the kicker is someone will come to your house and do the shot for you. And this is a huge stumbling block for a patient to say, well, I'll do, I'll do the injections, but we're not so sure that they actually do it correctly or they will skip um, intentionally or unintentionally. But to have what we call structured adherence, where a patient um, knows that, oh, so-and-so is going to come to my house and is going to give me the infusion on this date is enormous because the efficacy for that drug is going to be terrific. I mean, we have drugs that have high efficacy, but patients either miss doses or won't take them, and they break through. Here, we have a structured adherence. And when the folks from MAPI came to talk to me about it, I said, you know, this is, this is a very important concept. Number one, it's once a, once a month. But number two, you're going to have someone go to a patient's house and give them the shot. And you have to understand a lot of these patients, too, are disabled. Uh, and so to have somebody come visit them instead of having them to go somewhere else is huge. And that's the downside to infusions is it's a burden. But to come on a weekend or a weekday night, enormous. Plus, that patient will develop a relationship with that nurse, for sure. Because they do that now with our infusion center, where they come in and they have, they have get-togethers. Um, and they will say, oh, you know, I, I like going every month because I get to see my nurse every month. And then when we have to switch them from medication, they get disappointed. It's like, you mean I'm not going to see so-and-so? any longer. It's like, well, that's okay. You'll meet somebody else as part of that program. But I do think there is a component to this, the, the cure of personalists are taking care of the whole person. When you have somebody that's going to come to your house and do the shot, that's beyond just the efficacy of the medication. Because then it just shows that when I'm having a conversation with a patient, we care about you. You know, that this is not just here, take this medication, come back in six months, let me see. No. Somebody's going to come, and they're going to help you through this. You're not going to have to do anything. They will do the shot, and then in addition, they may actually do some other things. They may talk to you about your outcomes and so forth. And so I think um, that's a very, very appealing thing. But then the absence of the potential risk is huge. Um, I think the other areas, and I, I want to go to the second bullet to make sure I don't run out of time, is the physician thinking of this. So you have to understand, if you don't already, uh, if you've gone to any primary care visit recently, you've probably spent, what, five minutes with that primary care physician. Um, 
neurology in the community where most of our patients are cared for is no different. And so when a, an MS patient goes to see a neurologist, they have a lot of issues because they have bladder issues, they have vision issues, they have walking issues, they have pain issues, they have cognitive issues. And to be able to spend that time with the patient um, is going to be very difficult. And a community neurologist is going to say, oh my God, now I also have to think about these drugs that might have these other issues. I've got to check their blood work every month. I've got to do other these, all these things. In contrast, if they say, you know what, you can do GA or you can do Copaxone once a month and no side effects. You don't have to get any blood drawn. We don't have to monitor anything. And someone's going to come to your house for the treating physician. That's a win because now they don't have all this other paperwork they have to look and manage. So for instance, with Lemtrada, every month I have to look at that blood work coming in. And if somebody develops a low platelet count and I miss it, that's on me and I'll be sued. With GA, there is nothing to be sued over because there's nothing to monitor. And so for a practicing neurologist in the community, they're gonna quickly recognize this is my easy way out. This is the reason why um, GA right now is the most commonly um, prescribed injectable medication because you don't get flu-like symptoms, you don't get muscle aches, you don't get joint pain, you don't have to do any of the other monitoring. Now you have something which will be just once a month, same product, people are gonna say, I'm absolutely gonna do this. And just anecdotally, just talking to patients, I see patients, I'm in the clinic uh, every day, I've started to talk to them and say, you know, these are ideas that are starting to develop that you should think about. And pretty much universally, people say, I like that concept of you know just once a month. I like the idea that it's safe. I also like the idea that it's category B in pregnancy, and this is huge. Again, we're back to young women who have this disease that are thinking about having a family. A lot of these other medications are potentially teratogenic. They're category C or X. Um, those are the old categories. But you can say to somebody, you know, if you do this, even if you were to get pregnant, it's not an issue. Um, even if you were to get the injection and maybe in three weeks you got pregnant, it's not an issue. And in fact, it's probably the right drug to have if you're thinking of having a child. Um, and so again, the messaging for us to the patient, particularly young women, is, is very easy, very straightforward. And for the community neurologist who is just trying to maximize their time, writing that prescription will be that much easier. Um, and so that, to me, is where it is. And I also see this, um, people say, well, where do you see it? A newly diagnosed patient, you know, maybe somebody who's failed a couple drugs, maybe people have been on Limtrot or others. Absolutely. I can see this as first-line therapy, for sure. You could easily see this as somebody who is currently on an oral but is concerned that they um, may have a risk factor, would go to that. Um, and people who are on Ocrevus or Lemtrada who may not be doing well and who are now risk adverse. So my patient who developed ITP, she told me, and this is somebody whose husband is in the biotech space, but she told me, she said, that's it. I am not going to go on any other drug that has risk associated with it. You know, I've been bitten twice. I have MS and now I've got ITP. I'm not going to do that again. Um, and so there is a message here and the optics of it, I think, for me as a clinician, makes sense. You know, the, the phase two data, which I have seen, again, I'm impressed. The concept of no evidence of disease activity or NIDA um, is a very hot topic in neurology that we can actually essentially have complete remission of a patient. Um, and the data there, I know is going to be talked about, is quite strong. Obviously, will have to be confirmed in a phase three study, but I, it's hard for me to imagine that that same scenario wouldn't play out in a, in a phase three study. Um, and so all those are the background. That's the, that are the, those are the dynamics in the clinic for us. Um, those are the things I think about. Again, I am in the clinic all day long, and so I understand the dynamics of patients. I also understand my colleagues, and so I teach. Uh, I teach residents. I teach to my community uh, uh, cohorts, to my faculty. And so I understand what their thinking is as well, which may not be quite so obvious to you, but as reimbursement gets tighter and tighter, physicians are going to want things that are easier and easier, simple. And you probably already know that. I think I'm going to stop here. I got 13 seconds, so I guess I did all right.